to infinity and beyond. This is me. This is how I win. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Answer! You're a wizard, Harry. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. No. I am your father. Hasta la vista, baby. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Hello, everyone. Welcome back inside the film room. Zach Owens here with Johnny Sobchak for a trip to the wasteland. Johnny, we are back and we are talking Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. It's the long awaited sequel, prequel, next film in the franchise after the incredible Mad Max Fury Road. And we're breaking it all down today. Johnny, how are you, my friend? Doing well, Zach. Doing well. Thanks. Uh, I was really hoping you would we, chime in there and say, witness me and just scream it and spray some, some silver spray paint on your face. I'm sorry. I didn't come prepared uh, with my war <laughs> boy material, but um, it is a lovely day though. I will say it's nice little three day weekend here in the U S anyway, and a good movie weekend. I mean, obviously we have Furiosa to talk about. And of course, a lot of people have also been rewatching Fury Road. So I feel like our discussions have also kind of circled around that movie. And, uh, you know, we got plenty of other things to talk about. But um, Cannes Film Festival just wrapped up yesterday as of this recording. Lots of fun news and buzz out of there, which, you know, for most of us won't really precipitate into anything real until, you know, October, November or later <laughs> this year. So it's kind of a, a mixed emotions on that. But Overall, good, good, fun time. Um, The box office discussion is a little tiresome at this point and just the overall kind of dour feeling uh, online from people about the movie industry and the future of theaters and all that discussion, which, you know, there's a lot of different angles or takes on that, obviously. But uh, overall, keeping up, keeping up good vibes, Zach, what we're trying to do. Hey, man, we love to hear it because... There's a lot of uh, bad vibes in Furiosa. Not meaning <laughs> that it is a bad movie, but a lot of a lot of bad stuff going down. I just came straight out of a 10 a.m. screening of Furiosa. So what a way to start my Sunday, just rolling into a relatively filled theater. I know you're talking box office, but I was surprised to to have so many people on the Fury Road with me uh, at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning, but. It was a great way to start the day, rolling straight into the podcast. So, you know, it's going to be fresh coming off the the top of the dome. So there might be some extra excitement in here instead of, uh, you know, having sat with it for a day or two like you have. But I'm excited to talk yeah. talk about it. Um, before we dive in, of course, make sure all the obligatory promotions here. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you're following us on socials at Inside Film Room. And make sure you're subscribed to the Rewind newsletter so you can get everything we do sent straight to your inbox all in one place. But with that out of the way, Johnny, before we get into what we're watching, you mentioned it off the top, Cannes Film Festival, one of the biggest festivals, a lot of huge movies, a lot of huge news coming out of there. Give us, for the people, you're obviously the awards expert at Inside the Film Room, you're more in tune with all of the comings and goings of these movies and what they mean for awards season. Give us the, the, you know, brief synopsis, the recap of the biggest things that went down at this festival. Yeah. So it's, it was interesting following it. Obviously we're following it from afar you know, no one that we really know is at the festival um, covering it or doing reviews or anything like that, but there are definitely some high profile releases uh, that were going to be appearing, premiering at the festival the most notable ones, most likely for a lot of people, will be Kinds of Kindness from Yorgo, Yorgo Lanthimos. We also have Anora from Sean Baker, uh, which Neon is releasing. Kinds of Kindness is a Searchlight uh, production and distribution. 
There's also uh, the shrouds from David Cronenberg, who's obviously kind of like a cult favorite, uh, you know, filmmaker. Megalopolis from Francis Ford Coppola, which has been the probably that biggest, like most discussed film coming into this, especially given Coppola's significance uh, in film and just this is kind of being his big return. And um, a few others, a little less high profile, but in terms of the overall discussion, kind of like the vibes that have come out of the festival with regards to some of the more high profile releases I mentioned, the best reviews, some of the best reviewed films, the best reactions that we saw, Kinds of Kindness got pretty positive reviews, all things considered. I know Yorgo and his films, they can be a little bit, <laughs> uh, his older films anyway, I would say Poor Things and The Favorite a little bit less uh, polarizing maybe, but he definitely has his detractors, but it sounds like Kinds of Kindness by and large got good reviews. Right now, obviously very limited sample uh, of this, but on Letterboxd at 3.5. I believe on Rotten Tomatoes, it's in like either the 80s or 90s, I think in terms of like the, the critic rating. So um, that is promising. Really excited for that. That's a Searchlight release that I believe is out in June, if I'm not mistaken. June maybe. 24th, yeah. That's, that's yeah. what it lists right now. I was checking to try and see, excuse me, June 21st. Um, nice. Okay. I was checking to see like, if that's like fully wide release, if that's going to yeah, be like just the, you know, the big cities, but it seems to be all over, which is <laughs> yeah soon. Yeah. This is going to be a nice summer release. I feel like, you know, you see a 24, you know, most years they get a nice like big June or July release in there. Um, Neon can sometimes do something similar. Searchlight. Those are, these are kind of like the award type, you know, distributors that we look at and kinds of kindness is, Definitely not going to be a favorite or poor things in terms of award potential, I would imagine. Uh, it is cool, though, because in terms of awards, Jesse Plemons got an award for best actor in the festival yesterday when they did the ceremony, closing ceremony. So that's pretty cool. Obviously, Emma Stone is also in it. Uh, Willem Dafoe, Margaret Qualley, Joe Alwyn, Hunter Schaefer. So it's got a nice big ensemble. Really excited about that. Probably my most anticipated film of the summer, I would say. Um, just kind of off the top of my head now that Furiosa is out. And then, uh, you know, in terms of the other big releases, Megalopolis still doesn't have a U.S. distributor, a domestic distributor. It is making deals like throughout Europe and some other territories and countries. It'll be interesting to keep an eye on what exactly happens with that. You know, we it's an expensive, extremely expensive, um, you know, independent film, basically, that he self-funded. And we suspected it might be polarizing and the reviews are absolutely all over the place in terms of this movie. Some like one and like two star reviews in terms of like the spectrum, like there's a lot of those type of lower reviews. And then there are some that are like four and like five out of uh, five as well. So it's, it's hard to like gauge. I mean, it seems like it's going to be polarizing just no matter what, like I don't see it really changing even when more people see it i think it's just going to kind of fall all all like in between um so that that'll be interesting to see how that goes but there is no news yet of like where how we're going to be able to see that here in the u.s anyway um so that'll be something to keep an eye on it's supposed to be based on the trailer and everything it's supposed to be out this fall is the expected release so we'll see you know how that actually comes to fruition but um we expected it to be polarizing. Some people held out hope that it would be like, oh my God, this is like the best film of the year. One of Coppola's best films. I was very skeptical and like never really convinced even after the trailer came out, which looked amazing. I mean, visually at least and had some interesting ideas and the cast is really strong. Um, yeah, it was kind of what I expected. So <laughs> in terms of the reaction, so it'll be uh, again, very interesting to see how that plays out. And then in terms of some quick hitters and, and talking about awards potential as well, um, the substance movie already picked this up for distribution. The substance is from um, a filmmaker who did revenge from 2017, which is kind of a, Oh, I would say almost kind of has like a cult following in terms of that film. It's like super violent, um, a, re a revenge film. It's called revenge obviously, but Coralie Farge, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, but she's a French filmmaker and, uh, this is her follow-up to that film from seven years ago. So obviously kind of a long awaited, slowly gestating release, but this got really surprisingly positive reactions when it came out. I did not have it on my radar whatsoever. I haven't seen revenge yet. Definitely plan on checking that out soon, but this has gotten like very high praise as a body horror film 
comparisons to Cronenberg and it's got kind of like a sci-fi bent to it as well um, as a lot of those kind of films do. And it stars Demi Moore and Margaret Qualley. So that is a very interesting like duo. I think that's kind of an exciting pairing in Margaret Qualley. She's been busy. He's busy. She's got kinds of kindness. And then also, you know, this, this year and movie, it's nice that it already has distribution, even though it is a bit of a smaller kind of boutique, almost like distributor, it is getting a theatrical release and that is already confirmed for September, at least in the U S. So I'm optimistic about being able to see that in a theater and getting to see what kind of reactions there are comparisons to like Teton, which is a movie that like really shook me up when I saw it in theaters. And it was also a can uh, premiere. Um, and just uh, lots of talk about the blood, the 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 images in this movie. Like it's been just called like pretty much totally batshit in terms of like where it goes, um, like super hyperbolic reactions. But like everyone has said pretty much the same thing. So I'm I'm led to believe that we should be getting something memorable, if nothing else. But the reviews were good, and it got best screenplay out of the festival as well, which is pretty impressive. And then uh, kind of the last two big ones I want to talk about is Amelia Perez which is a musical, I believe, by Jacques Audiard, um, also a French filmmaker. He did uh, films like The Pro a Prophet, and he also did The Sisters Brothers, which I believe went to Cannes uh, back in 2018. I enjoyed The That's Sisters Brothers. That's the Joaquin and uh, John C. Riley. Yeah, Jake Gyllenhaal, Riz Ahmed. Um, kind of a low-key Western, but I enjoyed it. Um, didn't think it was like amazing or anything, but I thought it was a good time. And uh, but he's got some other notable films, and and so he's pretty well well regarded. And this seems to be getting good reviews. It did get best actress for I believe like three or four of the the actors in the film. So that includes Zoe Saldana and Selena Gomez, who are kind of the the two maybe most high profile actors in the film. And then there's also uh, Carla Sofia Gascon, who is Amelia Perez, uh, the titular character, if you will. I think uh, Adriana Paz is the the other. Um, actor in this a mexican actor who was awarded or recognized so that was kind of cool they awarded like those like four kind of leading performances <clears throat> and supporting performances in this movie and it got picked up by netflix already so it's definitely going to get a, a wide release on streaming i'm sure it'll get some sort of theatrical run which will probably be more limited but netflix alone just having this film kind of leads you to believe especially given that it got um, another special award uh, yesterday at the ceremony, in addition to Best Actress, I think it says a lot about its potential uh, in award season. And I think Netflix, if nothing else, they are good at pushing movies, campaigning films uh, around that time of year. So that that could be something, especially with the Golden Globes, especially with critics, I think you know that could drive it to um, the Oscars potentially. And it, it's a technically it's going to be an international feature. Um, that that could be you know win competitive in that category and then the last big one is going to be from neon they picked this up um already like i said they had it going into the festival as a matter of fact they've been on on this project for a while now and uh sean baker i have only seen red rocket from him the florida project is also pretty florida popular. project is great yeah and i know people have said pretty much nothing but good things about that as well as tangerine which I remember from from almost 10 years ago now, that was just so hyped up is like, oh, it was filmed on an iPhone and like really almost like guerrilla like filmmaking. And uh, I thought that was such a cool concept. So I still distinctly remember hearing about that movie, even though I haven't seen it still on my watch list along with the Florida Project. But Red Rocket, I really enjoyed from a few years ago. And I've been looking forward to whatever he was going to cook up next. And uh, Mikey Madison, this is getting like her big like star making moment. Um as the lead in this film, I thought that was really cool when she was cast. And then here we are, you know, uh, it's come out, it's premiered and she's getting a ton of, ton of buzz. I think she's going to be a best actress contender probably throughout the year at pretty much every awards body award show. I think she's going to have people, you know, pushing for her. And I would certainly love to see it. She's been kind of a low key rising star in the last years, ever since once upon a time in Hollywood, she was also in scream and uh, this is kind of something where she's going to be able to really flex her her, her muscles. But um, it's been getting comparisons to like uncut gems and in terms of like the anxiety and like the stress levels. It's also kind of a rom-com like edge to it. So I think there's going to be some, I think it's going to be, if you know, obviously one of the best films of the year by the reactions and reviews, but also just one of the, maybe the most fun kind of enjoyable movies as well. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. 
we don't have any footage really yet, like a trailer, so to speak, or a poster. Just have a couple like promo stills floating around that they've been using on every single reaction or article so far. Um, but it's an interesting like Cinderella type story. She's a sex worker and she gets involved with like the son of a Russian oligarch. And then it just kind of like spins out from there. So um, I think that that sounds like a good time. And uh, I'm just really happy that that movie has gotten the buzz it has. And Sean Baker, like I said, he's been around for so long to see him get that that reaction, get that recognition, I think is is very cool. And he's always online. He's on Twitter. He's on Letterboxd. Um, it's always interesting to like get to hear his thoughts and kind of a more personal uh, platform like that. So um, very, very cool and uh, should be out again, probably a while before you see it. I'm imagining it's like an October, November release, most likely. Um, My only question for Enora is will we see Mikey Madison go up in flames? Because <laughs> so far I've seen her in two oh, movies man. and it's Possible. happened. It's happened both times. So I'm not ruling it out. I know you said it's got kind of like rom-com vibes almost, but <laughs> I don't know. You never know what's going to come with this girl. If it's going to be another three for three going up in flames. Yeah. Once upon a I time mean, in Hollywood, check scream, check. Like I mean, it's, if getting I had, out of, it's getting if out I had, of control. Two nickels for every time Mikey Madison has been lit up in flames in a movie, I would have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it is weird that it's happened twice. So fool me once, shame on, <laughs> shame on, fool me twice, fool me three times. So can't get fooled again. I am uh I'm really looking forward to that one. It's definitely shot up my anticipated list in terms of movies like the rest of the year. Um definitely sounds like one that will be worth watching, like a more enjoyable, kind of mainstream crowd pleasing film, but also like a pretty Pretty high profile awards uh, contender in terms of Sean Baker for directing, writing, uh, Mikey Madison as, as actress. And then, you know, maybe it could get a Best Picture nomination out of that, Best Editing, things like that, screenplay. Um, so, yeah, lots to, lots to look forward to. And I'm sure some of these films will be making the rounds later this year at other festivals, potentially, you know, TIFF, New York's, um, Telluride, things like that. So, you know. Hey, maybe I'll end up seeing one of these at one of those festivals potentially. Well, you know, fingers we'll see. crossed. I know. Um, speaking of festivals, interesting that for this movie for Enora, um, Sean Baker has collaborated with Chris Burgosh for the longest time on Tangerine, Florida Project, and Red Rocket. Um, and I know we got the chance to chat with him at Film Fest Nine One Nine ahead of Red Rocket as like his co-writer um but now this one is just sean baker Burgosh is not involved here so yeah i'm curious yeah. how how that may or may not affect just like any you know similarities or through lines between the the films that we just talked about that that we've enjoyed from sean baker definitely well thank you for your report from france johnny if only you were there <laughs> live from france here's the <laughs> Here's the latest uh, on Cannes Film Festival. <clears throat> oh, well, other than news about Cannes, what else have we been watching? Other like other than refreshing our timelines on, uh, <laughs> on Twitter. I Honestly. know for my for myself, <laughs> um, TV wise, I wrapped up Survivor season forty six. It aired the finale on Wednesday. Um, spoiler alert for those who are not watching or did not watch. But shout out to Charlotte. Because the winner is from the Queen City. Putting Charlotte on the map. Great to see Kinsey get that dub for the hometown. Um, it was a good season. Started off really, really bad. Because everyone was just like idiotic. And then it slowly ramped up. Um, and was good, really good by the end. So I'd say it's like middle of the pack for me though. Because we're 46 seasons deep. So, you know, it's got to be really good to to be up there at the top, but I'd say like top 20. So upper, upper half. Um, and then also, you know, just continuing on the reality TV train, I have been told by literally like everyone I know that watches reality competition shows that I need to watch traders, um, which is like a, basically like a compilation of every other reality show. So they've got like stars from reality TV series. Like there's people from Big Brother, from Survivor, from Real Housewives, from um, The Bachelor. And they're mm -hmm. all like in this house together. Um, it's very like thematic murder mystery. The premise is basically there's this group of reality stars. Two of them are traitors and will like be quote unquote killing 
the others and like it's basically like the game like assassin if you ever played that like where it's like two people are killing they have and then like everybody else has to find out who the two people are and they like if you get killed you get eliminated um and so it's like if the the traders win at the end they get all the money between the two of them and if the the faithful win they split all the money between the larger group of non-traders um but I'm only two episodes deep. I started with season two because that's the one that everybody said is amazing. And it's got some some strong survivor people in it. Um, this aired like maybe earlier this year. It was like in the spring, I think. Um, and people were like all about it. And it's really like blown up in this second season that now people are like, oh, we'll have like traders watch parties for next season and stuff. It's on Peacock. Um, but I'm really into it, especially coming off just like having watched multiple seasons of survivor. Um, so I would recommend it from what I've seen so far. Once I catch up, I'll give a, a more in-depth breakdown, but really into it. Um, and then it's just been the wasteland for me on the movie front. I rewatched Fury road, uh, to get ready for Furiosa. Obviously watched Furiosa. We'll talk about that here in a second. And I watched the OG Mad Max for the first time. Um, I can't remember if we talked about it last episode. I don't think we did. But when I know a year or two ago, Warner Brothers had like released the 4K box set of all of the movies, which now they're going to have to do again because Furious <laughs> is out. Yeah. Um, so I watched the first one for the first time. And I know you had told me afterwards, like, you need to watch Beyond Thunderdome, which is the third one. Um, Wait, because I said that, that? Didn't you say that? No, oh, no, no. I said The Road Warrior. Road Warrior. Okay, my bad, my bad. Wait, so second one. That's the second one then? That's the second one, yeah. The second one is like, I think- Whichever I've one you said was like a great action movie. Yes, that's like the most full-blown, like top-notch action okay. movie. Okay, my three. apologies. Did not mean to to Putting put words in my mouth. mistruths in Damn. your mouth. <laughs> um, sorry, just got my Mad Max movies confused. But um, so I have not watched two or three yet. So I just watched the first one and then went straight to Fury Road because I was running out of time before Furiosa. But that first movie, man, I think it it is a miracle. This is also like in 1970 something. I don't know. Um, it's like maybe 78 or something. It's like an exploitation film, basically. Like It's, it's very, 79, yeah. Very low budget. No, literally, it was like school project. Um, let's go wreck a car. Like, I it, it hold is on. it is a I miracle. I have to say this real quick. I have to say this. Talking about the money surrounding this film. So this movie came out in 1979. Okay, the budget was 350 to 400 thousand dollars. And do you know what the box office was? Uh, well, I have it pulled up right now. In the U.S., more than 100 million dollars worldwide in gross revenue. Isn't most that most profitable film of all time and Guinness World Record at the time? Is that not like like my mind is just like impossible to comprehend that. Well, like, that. <laughs> I think everyone was misled because I did this is like it was just it was way too weird for me because like at least in Fury Road, everything is like weird and excessive, but like in a very thrilling way. And for this, like, I don't know if I was going into it with more of, like, an impression of, like, the world of Fury Road, but this is nothing like Fury Road whatsoever. And so for me, this is, like, an absolute miracle that we got from this movie in 1979 to what we got now with Fury Road and Furiosa, um, which is what I said to you, and that's why you said uh, to make sure you watch the second one um, to really see. It's quite a jump from the first one. Because that's like not even just like like quality wise, but like world wise, like they're literally in like regular Australia in the first movie. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I'm like, how is this connected to like this post apocalyptic, like desert wasteland, all that? So so hopefully some of those questions will be answered in this second one um, that you have recommended, which is not the Beyond Thunderdome. It is no, the road the road yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's what Road that's Warrior what I've been watching. Has, Road Warrior has a sequence that is like pretty much the prototype of the war rig like concept for Fury Road. Like it's basically just this crazy chase scene uh with the semi truck. And it's really, really like especially when you think about how like 
it, as it as a follow up to the original movie, like just making that jump filmmaking wise, very impressive. And also when you consider like the the era it was made in as well, I think it's just very, very good, very good jump. Um, still, I mean, Fury Road is by and far the best film of all of them. I mean, I think Fury Road, when you're watching it, you're like, OK, this is like the greatest movie ever made. Um, and I don't quite feel that way watching the other two that I've seen. But um, for me, in terms of just what I've been watching real quick, TV, been totally locked into Hacks season one. We were flying oh, yeah. it. Um, with our schedules, unfortunately, haven't been able to finish yet. We're, we've been stuck on the finale for like a week now. Um, oh, no. but we should be getting through and, and, and cranking through season two here in the next couple of days. So should be making steady progress but loving it absolutely loving it i think the mid middle to end of season one is really strong i think it just picks up quite a bit um in terms of the in, in the writing and the characters i think are just really great so definitely recommend that show check it out if you haven't already i've mentioned that before in season terms of movie- it's so good because it's like the for the longest time we didn't know like if there was going to be a season two and like season one very much could have been like a one and done like it's so good yeah like self-contained but to get a season two was a blessing and then i have not fully caught up on season three where we were doing some traveling last week and haven't caught up with the two most recent episodes i think but season three is very good as well so i'm excited to chat through that once you're caught up yeah it seems like it's just been very consistent and that's what we we love to see with our shows so uh loving that and then with movies nothing too too uh shocking here uh the one new thing notable new film that i've watched um and when i say new i mean new to me is michael clayton from 2007 gotta shout out jake (laughs) because he has been championing this movie for a long time now and has been really uh pressing upon me to watch it and i've been putting it off putting it off haven't found it like on streaming just conveniently to, to throw on um but me and my buddy clint i was like hey you want to watch this like i've heard nothing but good things and jake keeps telling me to watch it and he was like Oh yeah, no, this looks really good. Let's do it. So we rented it on Amazon for like three or four bucks or whatever, and absolutely loved it. it. It's it's an amazing movie. It's um, it's hard to describe. I, I feel like the less you know, the better. Like I knew very little going into the movie, but I think anyone that is just a fan of great acting and great writing, <laughs> the two like hallmarks that make up a great movie, like you're gonna enjoy it. Um. And I'm even I'm not even like a big George Clooney fan, but he plays Michael Clayton in this movie. And I mean, this is by far his best performance, in my opinion. I think he's fantastic. And Tilda Swinton's great. <clears throat> um, the whole cast, I think, is very good. But Tom Wilkinson in particular is like biblically good in this movie, I think. And uh especially the opening monologue is just unbelievable. So gets you from the start, and uh it's a tidy two hours as well for such a love it kind of a, a broad uh, scope film. So definitely check it out when you get a chance. It came out uh, in 2007. So it got kind of lost in the shuffle. When people think about that year, they think about there will be blood and no country for old men or Zodiac. And uh, I think it does get a little overshadowed, but I think it's maybe not quite like a, a full blown masterpiece in my opinion, but it's, it's an amazing film. So definitely give it a chance. And then Fury Road, check that out <clears throat> once again, first time watching it after a few years of like holding off. It's like one of those movies I've seen, a dozen times and I just like kind of I want to avoid like wearing myself out with it um but after like four years I finally threw it on again before Furiosa and man it's like it's just so <laughs> it's just so good it's perfect it's a perfect movie like if I'm listing off like my top 15 or 20 movies of all time like it's definitely in that list um no question it is like as Josh said in our group chat recently I, I love this word it's unimpeachable in terms of like <laughs> filmmaking and like as a film experience like it's so good and uh also through on the black and chrome edition like literally i watched it on like thursday night and then friday i was like working from home and i just threw it on like in the background while i was working and i was like kind of just like taking it in like secondhand and it's just like damn and it looks amazing like the black and chrome edition on the blu-ray is just stunning even though color in the uh the original cut is just so immaculate but I've never good... watched that version. It's which is yeah. like you just said. It's it's crazy because how beautiful and important the colors are in the the theatrical regular version. Like absolutely, the the like oranges and blues and and dark purples are just like 
to me that that like is so much of what fury road is it's interesting that you say that and it definitely well the cool thing is on the blu-ray when you watch that version you can watch it with or without an introduction from george miller and of course like why not throw it on there so i i, I watched that so he talks like for a few minutes about the movie and kind of the concept and he says originally like in his vision he wanted to do like a black and white movie and he ended up not obviously um because i don't think they would go for that but um it, it, it's interesting because i think in his mind and the way he's making the movie like the color is important and he even admits like there is a little bit of something lost in certain scenes or certain ideas maybe what when you take the color away but he says in his opinion like the best version or his favorite version is the black and chrome edition um and i think part of it is as important as amazing as the colors are like when you strip all that away you can really focus in on like the actual shots like the compositions the camera movements the storytelling like through the visuals and without the color like it's just about the bare bone like elements of it and i think that's a really interesting way to to, to watch it like i said i wasn't totally keyed in on it the entire time but when you see it through that different lens i think it does make you think about the movie and like interpret it a little bit differently which is kind of cool it just just really shows like how important like color can or um can be in a film and also like when the filmmaking is on a certain level like even without color it doesn't you don't lose very much if anything um, so it's just a fun like little exercise. I only recommend it if you've never seen it. And then other rewatches, Dune Part Two is finally out on 4K. Got the disc, got the Steel Book Edition. It's beautiful. Love having it in my hands. I can't believe it's finally like after years and years, like you have like the full collection at home to watch. This is just very surreal. Um, I've th I've thrown it on like a handful of times. I'm like micro dosing Dune Part Two in 4K. <laughs> um, when I'm doing like chores, I'll like throw on like a scene or something like that. Um, and I did watch the whole movie, like basically beginning to end. And uh, I think even at home is my first time watching it at home. Um, and without like that, well, that without seeing it in like IMAX or like Dolby, obviously, like uh, that's the experience I've had. And a lot of the IMAX, I saw it mostly in IMAX. I think I saw it once or twice in Dolby, even without the IMAX aspect ratio, even without a big sound system, like my sound's great on my TV, but it's not like a Dolby theater, obviously. Um, it's you mean still you don't have a Dolby theater in your house? <laughs> it's... <laughs> Oh man, wouldn't that be the dream? Um, but it's still like I know it's an amazing film. I know it's a masterpiece in my mind because it still like grabs me and like absolutely like entrances me when I'm watching it just on the the standard visuals, the standard aspect ratio, and all that alone. And the sound, I will say, I talked about this in the group chat. Obviously, the visuals are amazing. Um, Greg Frazier, etc. But the sound on this 4K disc genuinely might be the best sound i have had at home on a movie like even thinking about oppenheimer other christopher nolan films other villeneuve films like 2049 or the first dune it's just astounding it's so crisp it's so loud the mix is just pristine you don't lose any dialogue it's all very clear um and it has a lot of punch to it so um definitely like you have to own it if you if you like dune if you love Dune, if you have a chance to get it i would highly recommend it and then uh, last thing I'll mention as we move into Furiosa is I before seeing Furiosa, last time I was in theaters was for my fourth viewing of <laughs> Challengers. Um, Reagan wanted to see it again and some of her friends wanted to see it. They hadn't seen it yet. So we went together as like part of a group and it was it was late night um, last weekend. And, it, you know, it's late night in, in my town. You know, you don't really expect the theater to be that busy. But at like a 10 or 1030 showing, like there was actually like a good amount of people in there. And it was already on video on demand as well. Um, people were still in the theater and like, it was a good crowd. Like people were really into it, like having like reactions and it was a fun time. I don't know if like, if you're watching it for the first time, I don't know if that'd be optimal viewing, but for a fourth watch and to like really hear people's thoughts and like reactions and whatnot, like throughout the movie, I thought it was a, a fun experience. So I absolutely love that movie. It's still my number two movie of the year. Spoiler alert. Um, just a masterpiece. And I think it's, uh, it's going to end up being in my top five probably i would say by the end of the year even with all the great stuff still like i'm just such a good movie if you haven't seen it yet i mean you absolutely gotta check it out certainly recommend seeing it in theaters but i already got the blu-ray pre-ordered um even with the very minimal like there's it's not a 4k there's like no special features but i definitely want to own that movie and uh i i am very much surprised i know you talked about you got to see it first and you were really hyping it up um but i feel like i was just totally like floored by that in a way i was not expecting um, we've already talked about the movie at length, obviously, but 
still like after a few weeks, it's still, it hasn't faded in my mind at all. Um, and social media definitely won't let it fade because it's like so much. It's posting, still, like, it's still the edit. moment. Yeah. yeah. It's a good time. So I just love when people get behind a movie like that. It makes it, uh, makes it fun. Man, we went straight from Dune part two being the talk of social into challengers and challengers still has the the <laughs> grip on social, but I have the Dune part two 4k as well. I have not broken it open yet. So that is definitely coming soon. Um, and challengers is on the list as well for, I think that comes out in June, maybe on Blu-ray. Maybe, um, I think it's late June or maybe early July or something. Um, but uh, it's the same day because I got an email for it. It's the same day as Twister is coming oh. out on 4K from Warner Brothers because they're doing both. Right. Ways. Yeah. Um, so that'll be out ahead of uh, the Twisters, the sequel there. But yeah. All right. It's time to head to the wasteland. Time to witness us for our Furiosa, a Mad Max saga review. So here we are, headed back to the wasteland. It's George Miller's prequel slash sequel slash fifth movie in the franchise. <laughs> um, you know, it's a prequel. I say that because it's a prequel to Mad Max Fury Road. It's not necessarily a sequel to the the first three, but it comes later in the sequence of events. So I guess it's sort of a sequel. But anyway, this movie, Furiosa, is all about the origins of Charlize Theron's character, Furiosa, from Fury Road. It was the the just, like, breakout star. Not Charlize Theron. She was already a star. But, like, this character was just, like, <laughs> the moment of Mad Max Fury Road. And everyone knew they wanted more of her. Just absolutely enraptured by it. The performance, the character, everything about her. So to get this movie uh, has done a lot for just that character and I, I want to talk about it once we get into it but like how this informs fury road and like your takes on the character there it really just builds on on furiosa and everything you know about her from fury road into this movie but we've got not charlie's throne back but instead anya taylor joy is playing the younger version of furiosa we've got chris hemsworth in here and Charlie Frazier and Tom Burke in smaller but still significant roles. Currently sitting at an 89% critic score and a 91% audience score. Johnny, I know you have rated this movie on Letterboxd. I just came out of the theater, so I'm going to give you a live rating. But first off, what what do you have for us? Well, I got to say real quick, I know we just mentioned the cast. Cannot forget Alila Brown who plays the younger version of the even younger version of Furiosa in this movie. Um, yes. I think there's, there's something very cool about the way that she is integrated into the story and the way she um, is, is works as like the foundation of the story without getting into too much detail there. But, that was a big surprise for me. Um, so we can yeah. talk about that in a bit. <laughs> yeah. But um, I mean, outside of that, um, obviously, yeah. I mean, you gave a great uh, kind of, prelude there fury road one of my favorite movies of all time i know this movie has been gestating literally since they made fury road and i think i even heard or read in an interview recently where george miller said that they wrote this story or like developed this story for this concept of the film before they made fury road or while they were making fury road so it was basically used as a script to get the cast and crew of fury road to understand more about this world so it's almost like it, they made like two movies at once almost on, on paper at least during fury road and then years later now we're getting almost a decade later we're getting this epic very epic um prequel and i mean epic in like the truest sense of the word obviously you know it's huge lots of effects lots of cars motorcycles lots of characters but epic in the sense that this movie takes place over like 15 years i think mm -hmm. and there's just, I mean, it's really like an odyssey. Like, I think they even used that word in one, like the first trailer for the movie, um, you know, back, back, you know, however long ago that was where they say like, this is her odyssey. Like it's, she is going from being a child and like being in this kind of perfect idealistic like situation and then going through hell. <laughs> uh, and obviously we know like where her character ends up in Fury Road, but what she goes through in this movie and like, the depth that's added to the character and the depth and, and 
breadth even that's added to the world of the wasteland um and, and like characters like a morton joe and things like that i think it it really is um it works very much on its own terms but i think it just strengthens fury road and fury road obviously like strengthens this movie so very interesting like as a concept i think looking forward into this film and i think for years i've been wanting to see another movie in this universe loving fury road so much and and more about this character because she's just such an incredible character and like instantly iconic from the first movie like you said and you know was charlie's Theron going to be the actor and then okay no it's not going to happen because she's older now and they don't want to do that then anya taylor joy came along chris hemsworth like it all came along very quickly i feel like at, like two or three years ago um and it just worked you know i think it worked out like as best as it could have i think i think we got something worthwhile um but obviously I, I yeah i'm still like waiting to hear exactly what what you thought about it but um i certainly enjoyed it <clears throat> no i i'm with you i like this movie a lot um i have not watched fury road nearly as much as you have because that's an exorbitant number but i've seen it a, a good bit and i remember watching it fury road at the varsity theater on franklin street um my summer going into freshman year like we were there for summer school um, and just like me and like three dudes just like walking around didn't know what to do freshman at UNC and we went to the varsity and saw this and had no idea like what to expect and everybody else was like what's going on and I was just like blown away by it um, so definitely have been a fan since it first came out but no this movie was great I I'm feeling like a solid four and a half stars, like 85 ish range. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I think right. it's not, it's not as good as Fury Road. Um, no, which no. is like an impossible achievement, but yeah. it was still really good. <laughs> I agree with a lot of what you said about like it expanding on the world, on the character. Um, Anya Taylor Joy's great. I did not mean to, to slight the younger actress alila <laughs> brown when when mentioning that because that was something that i put um down in our bullet points to talk about was just like this yeah. character of furiosa and how it's obviously like anya taylor joy and like all the marketing but yeah we don't get to see her until part three essentially um but no really really liked it excited to talk about it let me give a quick plot synopsis before we dive in but snatched from the green place of many mothers Young Furiosa falls into the hands of a great biker horde led by the warlord Dementis. Sweeping through the wasteland, they come across a citadel presided over by the Immortan Joe. As the two tyrants fight for dominance, Furiosa soon finds herself in a nonstop battle to make her way home. There you have it. Um, uh -huh. So for this movie, like, I don't know. I don't know where to start. There's so much. Um, I guess for this... I was not expecting it to be like told in three different or sorry, the five different parts. Was it five or six? It was um, five chapters. Yeah. Okay. Like in the different chapters, like, I don't know. It's just, it was interesting because Fury Road is like, so go, 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 go the entire time. And this like had a, a bit more um, like stop and go, if you will. Um, yeah. Versus just like Fury Road. You're just like essentially on the road the entire time on their journey. Um, but this had like multiple journeys and chases and the the in between of it all. But I also was not. We'll, we'll get straight into the um, Anya Taylor Joy and Furiosa and the young Furiosa, all of that. Like I did not realize that. I know we see the the younger version picking the the peach at the beginning in the trailer, but like I didn't yeah. anticipate having a full hour of that version of Furiosa before we even get Anya Taylor Joy. Yeah, but if I thought that four, honestly, yeah. I mean, it was it was part three where it switches actresses, um, which I don't know what the official like timestamp of that was, but um, I thought that Alayla Alila was fantastic as this young version, and I thought it was like a, a seamless transition between the two, and even like Anya Taylor Joy's voice to match Charlize's Furiosa voice was like very spot on. I thought it, it all felt like very cohesive as three different people playing this one character um mm -hmm. but i guess take it away what what are what are the thoughts here on the, the storytelling the <laughs> setup of it all how do we feel yeah so yeah i, I mean I, i'm agreeing with kind of everything you're saying there i really i was trying to obviously keep my expectations in check 
I said earlier, you know, I've been looking forward to this movie for years now, literally. And my expectations always were pretty high just because I have such faith in George Miller. And, you know, he's so proven as like a visionary filmmaker at this point. Like I, I always figured he could deliver something good or great. Um, and I think he certainly has, uh, you know, with Furiosa. It's very different from Fury Road. I think the good thing is going into the movie, like I had that pretty well cemented in my mind that it was in terms of like pacing and story, like it was just going to be a different type of movie. Mm -hmm. um, I think anyone that's maybe let down or disappointed by the movie, you know, maybe that expectation has something to do with it. Like you're expecting like another Fury Road when it's definitely not that. Um, I think is, is something it certainly that... had those like still those elements of it and like the like yeah. it it was very connected and like the two main sequences of um the like st in the stowaway chapter yeah where that where she first teams up with um Praetorian Jack I think yeah. that was his name um like that was straight out of Fury Road and like elevated even further with like the um the like flying parachutes and the yeah. like pro <laughs> propeller things like that was it, that was very much like okay we did fury road how can we like make this even crazier and with the uh what was it called at the the back of the the like boom oh the yeah the, the, the uh, little fella with the yeah. little spinning it was so <laughs> that was intense yeah i can't remember exactly what they said that that was called but yeah no i mean there's definitely i will say in terms of like concepts and like visuals like it definitely stems directly from fury road it's very different still in a lot of ways but like there's really nothing like this movie except Fury Road. And even Fury Road, I think, is pretty mm -hmm. different um, in terms of that. I, I'm not, like, at the level of, okay, this is a masterpiece. Like, this is, like, as good as Fury Road. I've seen people online and even, like, pretty high-profile critics saying, like, this is as good, if not better, than Fury Road. And, like, I could not disagree with that more, obviously. Um, and that's not to take anything away from this film. Like, I think it's a, it's a pretty amazing film in a lot of ways. Like, visually... It's astonishing. Like, again, there's not anything really like it on a visual level. I realized watching this movie, like I turned to to Reagan multiple times during the film and I was like, this is amazing. Like, that's amazing. Like, I was really just like, I had like a huge smile on my face. Like, absolutely loved like pretty much everything in this movie. Like, I, I just really had such a great time with it. But there, for me, I don't think I ever quite got to the level that I'm at, like during the highest highs of Fury Road. Like, when there are certain moments and like even really just extended sequences and stretches of Fury Road where I'm like, like I said earlier, like this is like the best thing I've ever watched. Like this is just unbelievable. Like goosebumps, chills, like my like heartbeat is just like popping out of my chest. Like it's just such a different type of vibe to this movie where it is as you, I think pacing definitely has a big thing to do with it. Like even during the stowaway sequence, like it's a, it's an awesome sequence. Like it's probably the like, one of if not the best action sequence of the year so far um could just because like there's so much involved with it like yeah, as you mentioned there's these like there's the parachutes and like these kind of weird like propeller like fan like things that they're using and there's the the actual war rig part of it as well and the way that uh furios is like she starts like under the truck and then she gets to like the front of the truck and then she's on top of the truck like it's just a very like very well orchestrated very thoroughly thought out um action sequence and well realized action sequence but it, it has a different like texture versus like the stuff in fury road um it's very similar obviously but it's just it there's a different quality to it that isn't like necessarily worse in my opinion but it's just it doesn't quite itch the same scratch that i i have i guess in my brain um it definitely feels like a classic Mad Max story. Like I'm thinking about Road Warrior and like Thunderdome. And it definitely feels like that version of George Miller, like got handed like $150 million to make a movie. You know what I mean? Like, it, 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 and you, well, maybe you don't know what I mean because you haven't seen it, but like <laughs> it just, it's so unabashedly weird and over the top. And it just, it's definitely one of the weirdest, darkest big blockbuster like tentpole movies that i can remember in in like the last 10 years probably um like this isn't a movie like you see at this level very often 
Like there's some dark, disturbing stuff. In my opinion, it's the darkest, like most disturbing or upsetting of all the Mad Max films. Um, I actually showed Fury Road to Reagan's sisters uh, the other day. Um, and because we wanted to rewatch it, and they were we were hanging out with them. I'm like, I, I don't think it's that bad. Like, I think I think they'll be fine. Um, and we showed it to them. They both really liked it. And they're 15 and 13. Um, and I didn't feel like there was anything like too crazy in that. In this, like within the first like 30 minutes, I was like, okay, like I I was like wondering if we could show them Furiosa, and then I was like, mm, I'm not so sure. And by the end, I was like, yeah, no, like I don't think that this is. <laughs> like I just by my metric like I don't I don't feel comfortable maybe showing them certain things in this movie because it's just so I think given the epic like odyssey nature of it and the the depth of the characters and even the fact that I think Furiosa is a actual like a legitimate child for a large stretch of the movie it just has a different energy to it that isn't really in Fury Road um it's just, it, there's something more disturbing about it because she is a literal child who's being abducted, basically being like tortured in some ways, like mentally and emotionally, if not like physically. Um, it's, it, there's some really dark shit in here. And especially in the back end, like obviously once she's an adult, you can do even more like crazy things. And I mean, there's some visuals <laughs> and there's some like body horror elements in this. There's some like gore elements of this movie that are just way above anything in Fury Road, in my opinion. Um, and I and I say that in a good way. Like, I think I was like, OK, this is this is different. Like, this is bringing a different energy to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think is appropriate and warranted given the story. And by by the time you're in like the third, fourth and fifth chapters of the, of the film, like you think it's it's earned like where they go with it in terms of the the more maybe graphic or like intense stuff the but origins of of the arm the bionic the origins arm, of the arm that was gnarly that was freaking gnarly as hell especially like <laughs> when she goes like all the stuff they do with like the i guess i don't know how you would describe them like let, let's say in, in the context of the citadel they're like the peasants that morton joe like oh the the like the maggots and like the, they live when she the gets ground. rescued yes yeah that, like, that, that was the part that got me like i'm fine with like seeing an arm get ripped up and like almost torn off and then but then like when it was showing all of the like uh, <laughs> squirming maggots and like that was sites and stuff ugh, that was brutal um i think something that makes this like where this edges out fury road is like obviously this is much more like character driven and like like no pun intended on driven um but like the the narrative of like the backstory and the character development here because like everything it like we're just like thrown in you obviously have like movies worth of max yeah. characterization um but like in fury road it's a new version of max it's different actor um but there isn't really a ton of like dialogue back and forth of like building upon the character and their lore um so i think this this like does such a great job of that with Furiosa where we truly get like that 15 years, like you were saying to see her grow and like develop yeah. into who she is. And I think now like knowing that makes it enhances Fury Road even more because of like, yeah, yeah. You see that Max, like you obviously like know Max has lost his family and like is out for revenge essentially. Um, And to see like, okay, that's why, Furiosa and Max like click together well because they recognize that in each other now knowing all of Furiosa's backstory I know we had like the the surface level of it in Fury Road where we learned like her mom died on day three and yeah. like she was abducted and whatnot but like really seeing it and having that inform like why did she why was she so committed to helping out the um the women escape okay it's because like she in, in, in addition to just being like a good person uh like experienced it like being thrown in there and like yeah. raised attempted to be raised as one of the brides like seeing yeah. that how that shapes like her characterization and her views um I thought just like every it it was such a good version of like it wasn't in the sense of like a Marvel or a Star Wars where it's like <laughs> overtelling like all the tiny little details and like fan service but it was just like 
putting the pieces together in a way that felt natural and made sense in this story while also enhancing the story that we already had. Definitely. Natural is a good word for, it. I was about to say that. Like it, it feels anytime something came up that like had a direct connection to Fury Road or like informed something in Fury Road, it didn't feel it was, it didn't feel like it was done in a way where it was just, Oh, remember this from Fury Road or, you know, mm-hmm it just it did have a natural feel to it and i think the fact that it is an epic like longer movie it does i think it it makes more sense in that context because you're just kind of put in this person's shoes and you're just watching them go through their life in this way and it's obviously in the wasteland like it's it's a huge place but there's also these key focal points of the world and so it makes sense that they would be in and around these locations um and that that's how Furiosa would have ended up in the position she is at the start of Fury Road as this Imperator and this person who's kind of uh, has this position of power and is like trusted with transporting materials and people, etc. cetera. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's almost like, honestly, Fury Road now in the context of this movie is almost like an epilogue. <laughs> so like Furiosa in a way, um, rather than it being... It's it's kind of like a side quest mm-hmm. in her big quest almost, um. Because obviously, like Fury Road, she's alive at the end of Fury Road, so like her story goes on in mm-hmm. some capacity, one way or another. Um, and you're kind of hopeful or optimistic about the way that it ends. And I think now, given all the backstory, given the context, there it it does add like some weight to that, knowing what she's been through. Um, and I think that. Uh, the cast of characters in this movie as well, like Morton Joe getting to see like a younger kind of different version of that character. Like he's very much the same man, but he, he doesn't necessarily act the same. You know what I mean? Like he, he's clearly mm-hmm. younger um, to some degree. And just the way that he like engages with Furiosa or like the way that he engages with even Dementis, like you you're thinking like in the marketing or like in the lead up to the movie like okay like dementis is just like a different version of a morton joe but ultimately they are like very different types of characters like they're different types of tyrants or dictators mm-hmm. a morton joe is very like even just in his manner the way he speaks and everything you understand how now seeing him, him in this like how he got to the position he was in fury road like he's a very calculated calm like long-term like high level like thinker in the way that he like does everything whereas dementis like dementis is he yeah he leads people and he's able to put together like a gang basically but he doesn't have the same thought he operates on vibes brother yeah he's pure vibes and he does not think necessarily long term um or he doesn't he, he doesn't have the same success i guess you could say that morton joe does um even though he does, he has some wins in, in Furiosa, but he, you know, he he's kind of at his best when he's like outwitting like a child <laughs> and like outwitting people that are just clearly dumber than he is. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that was a very cool wrinkle. Like he's still a capable and like interesting and compelling antagonist, I think, but he's not like some perfect, like, um, you know, villain who's just like the way that he's outdone by Furiosa, like, you buy it and like it makes sense uh, by the time you get there i think um and so i thought that was very cool and then you have other characters that are in fury road like the people eater from from um the, who ends up running i think gas town in fury road um if i'm not mistaken then you have like the bullet farm is that the yeah. guy with the nose with the like thing yes, on his nose? And, and the nipple rings clamps that he's always rubbing and and like <laughs> it's it's just so funny like seeing these guys and it's interesting too because some of them are like the same actors some of some of the characters we know are different actors um i noticed erectus erectus was the same um the the son the big bulky son which i'm just learning is a former wwe wrestler oh what the hell that's cool yeah no i noticed yeah he's the same the son scro i think scrotus (laughs) he is a new character in like the context of the movies but he is a character who's appears in the video game but the actor who plays him in this movie is the actor who plays slit the war boy in fury road so like there's there's a lot of really cool combinations and like 
if you don't notice it, like it doesn't matter. If you do notice it, like it's cool and like it can be meta or it can be like totally contextual within the films. Um, so like I just love that. And like I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier, maybe I got I was about to say it and didn't, but while watching this movie, I also realized and like it really did hit me that George Miller is kind of like he's a like James Cameron level like thinker in terms of world building and in terms of like he really came I, I, we talked about this in the group chat like he is a doctor previously like a medical doctor and he totally like shifted fields and like came into the movie industry um and it's like kind of how i feel about james cameron like if he wasn't in the film industry like he would be like a doctor or like a scientist or something mm -hmm. uh, like he just has that brain where he's capable of like really anything he could do or like try to achieve like i feel like he would do it and george miller and the, but the thing is their imaginations are so bright and so like overwhelming that like when they get a, the budget that they do and they really put their like minds to it and get working with like some really amazing like creative people the stuff that they do on screen the stuff they're capable of is just like very few other films or very few other directors like i can think of that compare to that um and I think that's just like, I, I think it just, it really did hit me. Like George Miller is someone who I've been familiar with for a long time. Obviously he's been in the industry for like 50 years. Um, but now like, I really do like, maybe just cause I'm a little bit older. I've seen more of his work. Like I really do appreciate him more. Um, and I think that uh, just really special, like a sitting in the theater and like watching this, um, even if it doesn't necessarily, in my opinion, reach the heights of a Fury Road, it's not quite as good, maybe top to bottom, front to back. It's just a, totally unique and like singular um vision and singular like mm -hmm. work of art um and the costumes i mean the the sets um we can talk maybe a little bit about like the effects like the cinematography again very different i think in a lot of ways from fury roads a different cinematographer it's obviously a different like era in terms of like filmmaking i think making the movie like this 10 or 12 years ago is pretty different in, in a lot of ways than it would have been now um but just like the way he he adapts and like he tries different things and he just approaches this this film in a different way than he did Fury Road and I think it works in like really interesting ways. Um, I think this movie has more of like I said earlier it's it's more over the top. Like to me, Fury Road feels Fury Road is like super um, like there's a tangibility to Fury Road and like uh, like a, a grittiness to it where you feel like this is something that is actually happening in the world. Like this is something that you are living through and going through with these characters. Like, and you're, you're on the like cutting edge of the situation um, where anything can happen in Furiosa. It's more like, it's less like tangibility necessarily. And it's almost like a dream, like, like myth that you're like mm -hmm. being told, you know what I mean? Um, and it's, and I think that the way that they approach the visuals in a little bit of a different way, there's more like a dreamlike quality to it. Um, and even in some, like the tone of the film, I think Fury Road is a little bit more serious. Um, there's some great humor in that movie. And like, I think in, in the world building, there are some like, uh, variations to that, obviously in terms of the tone, but in this, it feels a little bit more like Looney Tunes almost in certain like aspects, like there's stuff with like the motorcyclists, like the, just their general behavior and like the Dementis like gang and like the way that, that, that they're killed. Like there's a, there's a gag almost like a visual gag where this guy gets shot off his motorcycle towards the beginning of the movie by Furiosa's mother. And he like, his legs are like straight up in the air and he's like head down. It's like Wile E. Coyote. Like, it is like straight up Wile E. Coyote, like slamming into like the cliff side or something like that. And like, it's, it's so much of a place. No, I, I agree. Like, as ridiculous as it sounds that you're saying, like, that Fury Road feels more, like, real. I know you're using the term, like, gritty and, like, you're, like, you're see experiencing it versus, like, the epic dreamscape yeah. sort of, like, like, it sounds silly, but it's very accurate. And, like, this, I think a lot of the humor or just, like, that whimsy of this one comes from the chris hemsworth character and like yeah like sure. he i know we we're saying he like operates on vibes and whatnot but like the dementis character is so like unserious it's like serious <laughs> and scary but like also so unserious and like just the way 
the scene, for example, where they find the the war boy and he leads them to the citadel and he's like trying to explain, he's like, is this Valhalla? And he's like, what's Valhalla? And they try and explain it and they're like saying, uh, it's a place of abundance and copious amounts of, and it's it's a place where a lot of, you have a lot of good stuff. Like the way that he just like, it, it, it kind of almost like breaks out of the the world of like this being such like a distant apocalyptic like it it finds a way to like connect like our world and this world versus like mad max fury road is so like it's just like it is just the wasteland and this one had more of like connections where like i was saying in that first mad max where like that was just like regular australia i feel like there were more like links and threads from like real life like when they're talking about engines or something too or like his yeah. historian that's telling him about the the motorcycle when they first meet uh dementis in his tent yeah no yeah no you're totally right I, and that was something else too like even i think it sets the tone like very early on like you have um for example when you're introduced to this world like at the very start of the movie like you're seeing earth from like above and you come down into like Australia. Like you actually are shown Australia from above and then you mm -hmm. just go smack dab in the middle of it. Um, and you get the same, even in the introduction, it's the same like sounds, like it's the same sounds from Fury Road's introduction. Some of the same dialogue, some of the same like stock footage. Um, and so I like that consistency in terms of like setting the stage of the, of the film. Um, but I think even from the jump, when you're like seeing the green place for the first time, and there's like wind turbines and they're like fishing and like, it, it's just a very, very cool. It almost reminded me of like, I'm thinking of like Wonder Woman almost like when you're seeing like Themyscira and it's like kind of this utopia um, land of like green and water. And like, it just like, everyone's like pitching in and it's like a communal um, society. Like it's just very, very pleasant and then you're kind of thrown into the hell and like the it, it's like a nightmare just the rest of the world uh in this movie um and talking about dementis too like chris hemsworth is so so good in the movie um not to say he's not great in other things i think he's a fantastic actor and has been for a long time but there's not really another role he's been in exactly like this one obviously um and he does play the humor very well like the goofiness of the character but also, like, it's interesting, like, the, that's what I'm saying with George, George Miller. He has such a great grasp on tone as well um, and, like, character and performance. Like, he is very funny, Chris Hemsworth, but he also is the character, like, Dementis. Like, you are genuinely, like, terrified of this guy. Like, you don't yeah. know. He's, he's very unhinged that, like, you don't know what's – he's not predictable. He's – exactly. Like, he's so insane. Like, you would hate to be within distance of this guy. You know what I mean? Like – it, you do not want to be around this man. And it's, and it's, again, it's comparing to Morton Joe, like it's not a carbon copy. Like it's just a different vibe versus a Morton Joe. You definitely wouldn't want to be around him at all. Like in the same room with that guy. Um, but at least with a Dementis, you might get some sort of like entertainment value from, from seeing him um, up close. But uh, yeah, no, he's, he's very good. He's very fun. Um, and that was another thing I appreciate about him is like Chris Hemsworth plays the character throughout the entire film, but you do see him go through like different phases of his life because of the timeline. Um, he starts out as like a very powerful warlord um, who has like dominion over like a bunch of different people that are like ride or die for him basically. Um, and then, you know, he goes through like this period where he's kind of down on his luck. Like he's just kind of like bored with what he's doing. And like, he doesn't want to be like in control, like and involved as much as like, he kind of put himself in the position to be in. Um, and he gets older and like, there's different things that happen with that. So I thought that was very cool. That was something I wasn't necessarily expecting from the movie, but I appreciated how they, how they did that. Um, and that, that very much parallels Furiosa's growth or arc in some ways. Um, but, uh, I mean, him and then Anya Taylor-Joy, I thought was just as good, if not better than Chris Hemsworth. I mean, she's been in a lot of great projects and I've seen her ever since The Witch. I mean, I've seen, I've kind of grown, we've grown up with her in terms of like, we're around the same age and everything. So getting to see her develop her skills as an actor and then to do something like this, which is just so far removed from anything else she's done. Um, she crushed it. I mean, she's very intimidating. She's very badass. Like you totally buy her 
as this Charlize Theron like stand in basically. Um, and she does a great job making it her own in terms of the character. Like it doesn't feel like slavishly, you know, trying to imitate what Theron did, but she's also like very good at like aligning the the two like versions. Like you do feel like they are the same person. Um, and I think that that was really well done, especially down the home stretch, like in the like the fourth and like fifth chapters. Like she, like I was ready to like stand up and like pump my fist and like clap because I was just so impressed and like the the badassery that she like it, it puts on display. Like she just absolutely crushes it, and you like buy like every like step of her development in that that regard. No, absolutely. Oh man. Also, another thing about Chris Hemsworth about the the Dementis character is that like he present like he presents himself you're talking about the difference between him and like Immortan Joe of like almost like of a good guy at the start of like talking like when he's trying to like essentially trying to like present himself as like a messiah type like let me come and free the people of the citadel and like you only they only have power because you give them power like basically like his challenge to Immortan Joe is so interesting of like just like a juxtaposition between one being a ruler that is like looking down on his people and scared of them rising up against him and the other one trying to like use them against him um so i thought that was a an interesting difference between the two and then another thing that i wanted to mention was um i know we're talking about like the building of the world and the expansion but um just like getting to see gas town i know we get like brief in fury road yeah. where they like call in the help of gas town and call in the help of uh what was it called bullet whatever bullet, bullet farmer. farmer um that sequence was really great too with um with uh jack and and furiosa when they're like the two of them versus everybody at yeah yeah bullet farm that was fantastic but just like seeing both of those and like getting outside of the citadel and just fury road like was was cool to expand on definitely yeah no i i i feel the same way um and i think that's the main thing like whatever qualms i have with the movie because like i said it's not it's not on the level of fury road and honestly i anyone that says it's on the level of fury road i respect your opinion but also i don't understand <laughs> like i i just don't i don't see it but um, even with any qualms I have with the movie, I think it's maybe, I didn't feel it was overly, I didn't think the pacing was like off necessarily. Like, I didn't feel like it was too slow or like, un, like, um, that's what we're looking for. Like it was inconsistent, like in the way that it kind of paced certain sections of the movie. Um, but it definitely feels like an epic, like it feels like it's got that length to it. Um, I know in the group chat, they were kind of discussing that. Like, I didn't feel like it was short by any means. Like it felt like, yeah, it didn't feel long. It felt like an appropriate length for like this story, which I think was, was good. Um, Fury Road on the other hand, I mean, that movie isn't two and a half hours. It's like two hours, but it feels like an hour. Like it just absolutely flies by, um, by the time, like the third act starting, I'm like, how is this movie almost over? Um, and in also, I, I will say like, I think the visuals, like they're so different compared to Fury Road. Like the aesthetics, a lot of the aesthetics are the are the same, but the actual shots that they put into this movie and like different elements of like the world building or like the myth mythology that is is kind of going into it, I think is very cool. It's very different from Fury Road, as I've said. It's got more of a like dreamlike quality to it in some ways. I think for the most part that works. I think in maybe some of the action sequences, it it feels a little bit less like it, it doesn't feel like as grounded necessarily as Fury Road. And it's very clearly like it's a very clear distinction. And like I think it's doing that intentionally to like set itself apart as like this kind of this myth or like fable that we're experiencing. And so I don't like hold that against the film, but it's just it's very different. And I think my my preference is Fury Road in that regard. Um I think also the, the other thing is again i enjoyed this as a film like as an experience and i think the acting the story and, and everything i think is is really really strong but i think in terms of the action like there's nothing in this movie as i said earlier that really stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with anything in fury road um i think fury road is just so so like mesmerizing in its action and it's just so like 
tangible, as I've said, that it, it, it just really like holds me in a way that, that, that nothing in Furiosa really did. Um, I think that's the only other thing as I would say as an action movie, I think it holds it a little bit back for me. Um, the stowaway sequence is like the highlight. It's amazing. Um, in a lot of ways, there are some things I think maybe could, could have been a little bit more polished quote unquote, or like a little bit cleaner in certain regards, but overall, I mean, very impressive, but the rest of the movie has good action sprinkled throughout, but there's nothing that's like really like edge of your seat necessarily. It's just all very like impressive and, and, uh, interesting to watch. I mean, there's a, there's a sequence where they show up at the Citadel for the first time. Um, and the war boys and a Morton Joe just kind of like attack Dementis and like his, his group. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's like cranes and like hooks flying around and there's motorcycles being lifted up in the air and there's war boys like diving down and like exploding. It's just, just a lot of the things in this are just things you haven't really seen before. Like it's just kind of original and like fun, like concepts. Um, and I think that's kind of what it's strong suit is just doing things like you haven't really experienced or like, it's just a very cool, like imaginative way of like, I guess orchestrating certain action. And like a lot of what George Miller does is very like pure in its storytelling. And he uses you know, all, all great action should be in service of the story. It should be, you know, telling, telling a story through the action. I think that obviously George Miller does that pretty much better than anyone else. Um, and I think just the things that he comes up with and devises for the certain beats throughout, I think is, uh, you know, just a testament to how, how great he is and how he can kind of engage you with whatever he throws at you, whatever he comes up with, um, whether it's, you know, the road warrior or Fury road or Furiosa, um, you know, he, he just, he has something fresh to, I think, experiment with, um, or to try to like, uh, you know, test himself with, even though he's like 80 years old or almost 80 years old. Like the fact that he's putting out something of this level is, I mean, it's undeniably like amazing and like hard to like wrap, wrap your head around, I think. So, um, overall, I would say very strong feelings about this movie. I really liked it. Not quite on like the, like, again, upper echelon like in terms of like overall film like i don't think it's like a five out of five for me i gave it four and a half stars i'd say out of 100 it's like uh, similar to what you were saying like an 85 out of 100 i think in terms of films you're gonna see this year um you know visually world building um storytelling like it, it, this is it, it's a high high bar um set with this movie and other blockbusters you know still to come i think uh I, uh, I'm excited. I already pre-ordered the steel book <laughs> to go with my Fury Road steel book. So, um, looking forward to that, that I'll be seeing this movie again in theaters for sure. Um, at least once more. Um, so definitely give it a chance. Even if you didn't maybe love Fury Road, this is a very different movie. So I, I think we've, we've kind of underscored that pretty well. Um, I would give it a chance. The cast is great. The action's great. Storytelling is great. It, it's got everything you want. It's just, it is dark. It is intense. Um, it is epic. It's got a little bit of a length to it, but um, definitely worth your time. Definitely worth seeing on the big screen. It's going to be one of the best big screen movies of the entire year. Um, the sound, uh, the bass in the Dolby theater I saw it at was just like, uh, the, the, it was like rumbling the entire like movie theater. It felt like I just really was impressed with uh, with a lot of the, the stuff going on in this movie, even though I had very, again, high expectations set. Um it, it, it really did meet a lot of them and surprised me in a lot of ways, which I think is, is the best thing um, in a, in a film franchise. that's you know, five entries deep at this point and been around for almost, you know, 45 years. Absolutely. I could not say it better myself, Johnny, a lot of high praise, big, big fan. I did not see this in any special format. I just saw it at the, the theater right near my house. Um, so I would love to see it in either Dolby or IMAX one more time just to to get that full experience um because it is such a theatrical movie not a this is not a, a I mean obviously you're going to rewatch it at home once you have the the steel book but it's not a witness it to witness me you want to witness it in theaters on the <laughs> big screen but there you have it a lot of two thumbs up, a lot of high praise for Furiosa from inside the film room. Thank you for listening. Thanks for tuning in week in and week out. 
We appreciate all of the love, all of the support, and would not be here without you all. Absolutely. Another great episode. Great movie to talk about this week with Furiosa. Appreciate you all tuning in, staying up to date with us. Definitely give that movie a shot. And uh, it's going to be an interesting summer. I feel like we're like fully in summer mode now. It's Memorial Day weekend in the U.S., obviously. So lots to come in June, July. And then uh, I'm sure before we know it, it'll be like festival season. So I, I'm just like trying to enjoy live in the moment, you know, um, but make sure you stay tuned, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, like us on Facebook and subscribe on YouTube to stay up to date on everything we're doing here in the latest episodes. You can find all of those accounts at inside film room. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe, rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, iHeart, YouTube, anywhere you can find a podcast. We are there. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter to get everything sent directly to your inbox. And be sure to come back next time. We will see you then.